How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of How to Play Death House. The whole overview, the whole walkthrough of Death House, the one-shot slash opener for Curse of Strahd campaign. Now, this is the second episode, so if you've not seen the first one from our series, please take some time to go back on the channel, check that video out, and then uh, check out some of the other stuff. Because in that video, we went over some of the lore, some of the first three floors, and a lot of different encounters that you definitely want to try out. Uh, for today, though, we are going to be finishing up Death House. We're going to be going through the attic. We're going to be going over some encounters I recommend for the area, as well as the dungeons below. Uh, one thing I always recommend with Death House is, as I said in the last video, definitely use it as a one-shot or a Halloween event, or you can even throw it in the campaign. Uh, but it's also a really good way to start Curse of Strahd. Curse of Strahd is a fantastic campaign. It's one of my favorites to run. We'll definitely run it at some time on this, uh, this channel as well sometime soon. So without further ado, we're going to be going over the attic as well as the dungeon levels today. Uh, and the last thing, as we said this last video, there are going to be tons of spoilers. So if you are a player who is going to be playing Death House, I would really recommend not watching this video because it's going to spoil everything for you. For DMs though, feel free to pick at this, adjust it how you want. Some of the stuff is homebrew, so keep that in mind as well. Just the way I like to run Death House, it's probably like my eighth or ninth time running it. It's one of my favorite uh, one shots or even uh, openings to a Curse's Draw. So first things first is we're looking at the attic level, which is the top level of the house. There's a lot going on, but there's also a lot of flavoring that needs to be done as well. So the first section here, this is the main hall of the attic. Now this area, unlike most of the house, which is well kept, tidy, as if there is a maid who is keeping it clean, this is a dirty, dusty area. It's full of cobwebs and spiders and dust that kind of uh, emulates across the entire floor. Uh, so it's kind of a creepy area and it shows you the difference of this place being abandoned up here compared to the rest of the house. Now there are two main bedrooms I want to focus on, which is this upper left one here and this lower one down here. Now both of these are, you know, they're good bedrooms, they have some good like, counters that you can add into them, but without some homebrew they're kind of bland. So the first one up here to the upper left, uh, this one is very basic bare bone. There's a bed, there's a rocking chair, there's a heated stove, and then there's a cabinet. What I would recommend in here is to add some type of small subtle encounter, maybe like a smell. That can be like a foul odor, or if you want it to be something more of a, um, a perfume smell, something that can kind of get the room a little bit off on edge, but don't put any encounters in here uh, per se. So this is something where they can kind of look around, they can be, you know, uh, cautious, they can be, you know, mysterious inside this area, but nothing needs to pop out here. Now we can make our way back down to that second bedroom. This one is very similar layout, but this one has a desk and it also has a doll. Now this is where you can add some cool encounters. So first thing, with the rocking chair, maybe you have the rocking chair kind of sway back and forth and stop. And the doll next to it is this wooden creepy doll. Now you can do this however you want. What I like to do is if they touch the doll, they'll see the doll throughout the house. So if they do touch it in any form or even destroy it, maybe they see it in a cabinet like that upper bedroom or they see it down in the dungeon, or they see it in their inventory, something that kind of gives them that shock and that fright. Um, I wouldn't make it like a doll trying to kill them or anything. I just think more of like that frightening kind of, you know, pop-upness with the doll. The other thing you do is maybe that's the uh, house's way of watching everybody is having the doll around them, so that could be another way to do it as well. Now as we move over to the storage room, these rooms are full of um, large mirrors, old furniture, old chests, and they're all covered in these white sheets. Now inside this room there is a chest that has the nursemaid, her skeletal remains in there. So if they do decide to go one by one to look around in here, have one of them be in the, um, the area where the nursemaid is. Another thing inside this room that they won't know unless they look everywhere or they see the dollhouse in the following room um, is there is a secret doorway or trapway down to the basement. Um, so when they find this, they can make their way all the way down to the basement to explore that dungeon. Um, there's a couple ways that you can figure this out, but one of the biggest ones is looking at the dollhouse in the final section of the attic. One encounter I would add to this room to kind of give it more flair than just this you know, passageway to the, uh, to the dungeon is maybe have one of the sheets floating around like a ghost, and then when it gets close, they could yank the sheet off or something revealing nothing is there. Now as we make our way up here to the children's room, this is one of the most important rooms of the full house before we get to the dungeon. This room has been boarded up and locked away for years where the two children, Rose and Thorn, have perished from starvation. Their skeletal remains are inside the room, along with their two beds, a window that has been sealed with brick, and then some toys. Now if you look at the window that's sealed with brick, there's tons of scratch marks for them trying to get out, but to no avail. 
Uh, the toy box is full of blocks, small stuffed animals, things like that that you can play with. And I would say if anybody touches that, that is when the ghosts of Thorin and Rose reveal themselves to the party. Uh, they would be, you know, uh, introducing themselves to the party. They will explain what happened in their eyes to them. Um, they'd be doing things like that. Uh, another thing I would say with this is, uh, with the dollhouse specifically, is they would show them the dollhouse, show them all the rooms. Maybe you can have like their wax figurines inside there as well. That'd be kind of creepy. Uh, but the big thing is this is a way for them to find that secret passageway down to the dungeons. So maybe they see um, in their little kind of spiral staircase that makes their way all the way down. Now, a lot of good information, got a lot of good lore in this room, but one of the big things is the children have not seen people in decades, if not centuries, depending on how you want to play this house. So what I would say is when the party tries to leave the room, the kids are very frantic to have them stay and play with them. If they do not want, um, you know, if they do not want to stay for eternity inside this room and they try to leave, the two kids will try to possess them. So if Rose tries to possess one of the kids, uh, or if Rose tries to possess one of the adventurers, they're going to be changing their personality. So if they fail that skills check, um, that saving throw, um, Rose will imbue herself inside and change some of that personality. Their personality will change to somebody who's more direct, a leader, and my way or the highway kind of pouty look. Now if Thorn does it, Thorn is more of like the scaredy cat shy who's afraid of everything. So you can just imagine a barbarian being possessed by Thorn and is afraid to even look down a hallway where there's a shadow. That's a great way to kind of play that room. You can also use good illustrations to show all of the beautiful kind of white um, cloaks and all the different uh, white sheets inside the rooms as well, building up on that fear factor. Now as we get to the basement, this is where all the chaos, all of the conflict, and a lot of the monsters are inside Death House. We'll start in section 22 right here. In section 22, this is the first spot that they go inside Death House. This area, you can hear faint chanting inside. You see that there are thousands of old footprints in the dust. The passage and tunnels are made out of wood and stone and dirt kind of held together by support beams. Now section 23 is full of crypts. There's from A to F and they're all different. A and B are empty crypts. There's nothing inside of importance. Uh, a is a completely empty. B is where Walter's crypt would have been, uh, but there's nothing inside. Uh, there's no coffin. There's no anything else inside. Now as we move all the way over to C and D, C is Gustav's crypt. Inside here is where Gustav's body would have been, but the doors are closed. It would take a strength check to open up the door. Inside, you'll see that there's an empty coffin with no body, revealing that Gustav's body is somewhere else inside the house. Now, D, this is where Elizabeth's body is. It's labeled Elizabeth. Uh, when you go inside here, uh, what you'll notice is there is a coffin, and when open, there is a swarm of insects that fly out and attack the party. In the book, they're centipedes. You can make them spiders. You can make them whatever. But that is the first encounter that the party could have. Now, I would have these uh, insects attack and then disperse. Um, I wouldn't have a full conflict here because there's tons of conflict coming anyway. Now, E and F over here, this is where Rose and Thorn's bodies should be. These areas have two coffins but no bodies inside. Um, and one good way to put the spirits of Rose and Thorn to rest, in which uh, Rose and Thorn would, you know, tell them to do this as well, is to bring the bodies here and put them inside their coffins. And if you can do that, you release their spirits from the house. If you don't, their spirits are still trapped here forever. I would give subtle hints for this. Don't make it as direct as, hey, you have to do this. But maybe the kids of Rose and Thorn might hint at this. Now, we move over to section 24 up here. This is the first section of the cultist area. This is the area where they would dine, they would relax, uh, they would have meetings. There are some old straw beds in there. But there's really nothing of importance inside this area. This just shows how dynamic and how large this dungeon actually is. Now as we move over to section 25, this is where it gets a little bit more. So this is actually the sleeping quarters as well as a large well where the cultists are. The well, I would add encounter of what I would call the dark powers. I would add some serpent inside that can fill them in with lore of the house or things that they might have missed. Maybe do some trickery to try to trick the party into doing things that it wants them to do. Now, if you're doing Curse of Strahd, this could be a really big part. Maybe you can start lore dropping some stuff with Strahd inside this area. Um, this is super important. This could be a really good encounter. It's not in the book, but it's something I always add to my campaigns. Now, all these different rooms here, A to E, are the different sleeping quarters. They all have a bed and a footlocker and then a small bit of treasure inside each room. In the first one, you can find some gold with a human pouch made out of human skin. 
The other one, you can find a cloth full of moss agates, these stones. The other one has an eye patch that's worth quite an amount of gold. It's about 50 gold worth. It has gold around the whole eye patch. In D, there's an ivory hairbrush. And in E, there's one of the best ones, which is a silver and short sword, which can be super useful if you're playing Curse of Strahd. Now as we're moving on over here to section 26, if they were trying to descend deeper in, they have to be careful because there's a pit trap that drops 10 feet. Not only would they take bludgeoning damage on a foul, but they would also take piercing damage from the spikes below. This is to keep the lower section safe from any visitors going inside. Section 27 over here, this is the other feeding area for the uh, common cultists. It's littered with bones, but one of the most important things is section 28 right next to it this little nook in the wall of 27 there might be like a flickering of light or something moving uh, as the party approaches what they would discover to their surprise is a grick this large mix of a snake tentacle like beast with a beak that will attack it'll grab and pull them in and try to fight this could be the first combat of the dungeon if they are ever so unlucky to disturb this creature now as they make their way down to section 29, this is where there are four ghouls that are kind of slowly roaming this area of the house. These are old cultists that have died a long time ago that will fight to the death anybody inside. As we move on to section 31, we have tons of skeletons shackled to the walls with a statue of Strahd von Zarevich standing there with an orb in his hand. What I would do is maybe have them enter into this dark room, seeing the statue, and then the orb will illuminate with light. And as that happens, shadow creatures come from the skeletons and attack. So in this room, there are skeletons, uh, but the shadows are the ones that actually attack the party. So these uh, shadows will attack, could be another combat. So in this section specifically, there's so much enemies, so it's very dangerous for people to get cornered or trapped or surrounded, because you have a Grick over here by 26, you have ghouls over here by 29, and then you have those uh, shadows inside 31. Now there is a secret covering here that descends up. So if we do find this section, it is a stairwell that climbs all the way up to the first floor of the house. I would not hint for them to find this, but with a good investigation or a passive perception, they can. This is super important because without this, they would have to ascend all the way to the attic and make their way all the way back down to escape the house where this is a shortcut that can cut them potentially dying on those upper layers right at the first floor to try to escape. But don't give them the easy way out just because you want to. Uh, make them work for it. Now over here by 33, this door specifically is a mimic. So be careful with the party going through there. It can bite them, it can attack them going through. 33 has some old chandeliers, some old candlesticks, and some old stuff on the table. Nothing much, but 34 back here is one of the most important rooms. This is like the big treasure room of Death House. In here, um, Gustav and Elizabeth both live as ghasts. These two ghasts hide in the walls and they wait for something to touch their stuff and they pop out. So if the party begins to look around, these two will burst out and try to attack. And if they're able to succeed in fighting them, they will find the following treasures inside. They will find a cloak of protection, which is an extremely important magic item. Four potions of healing. What I would do is I would have the number to the amount of party members in the group. A flask of alchemist fire a chain shirt, a mess kit, a bullseye lantern, and a spell book full of an assortment of spells. Uh, this is super important because they're going to need all of this to fight what is in the basement if they decide to do so. Now as they make their way over to section 30 down below, this is where they can hear chanting going inside the area. So they can hear the chanting um, swaying and voices inside here um, that the party can hear. So as they make their way down to section 35, what they'll see is an area that has tons of small sacrifices and cuts into the wall. These could be small things like goblin hands, uh, raven feathers, a jar full of mosquitoes, and all very mundane items, but they are creepy and they're supposed to, as a cult to say, help summon some bees. However, these are just mundane items. Now over here in section 36, this is an old kind of catacomb chamber which uh, would jail some of those sacrifices. Not only can you find some objects in here, and there are some uh, small traps you can add, but there is a secret passageway that will bring you into the main final sacrificial room uh, without going through the portcullis by 37. Uh, this is one way the party can go in and out with ease and well, relatively a safe way. Now section 37 here with the portcullis, it's a deep kind of steep decline with a ramp that goes into brackish murky water. This portcullis is too heavy to lift by yourself, but there is a switch on the other side that maybe a mage hand or a skinny halfling or small creature can sneak through and then open themselves. 
Inside this area is a large dome section. It's relatively large compared to all the other rooms inside Death House. There is water. There's a stand that goes around the whole sides. There is a large altar in the middle that has blood, carvings of leaves and vines and bats. And then hanging from the ceiling, there are these two shackles where they would have the sacrifices hang to be sacrificed to whatever creature lies in this area. That creature hides in what looks to be this big pit of mulch, mess, leaves, and vines. That's because this creature, when summoned, um, will emerge from this as a shambling mound. So uh, we'll get to that in a second. But before that, we'll talk more about this room as a whole. So inside this room, once they enter inside and go by that altar, they will see these visages or these illusions appear of these creatures floating, and they will chant different chants to the group. But one particular part is they will say, one must die, one must die. And with that, the party has two options. If they sacrifice any living being, it could be a party member, it could be themselves, it could be a dog, whatever they have that is living. If they sacrifice something on that table, the whole house goes dormant and quiet. They can leave, there are no more monsters, it is quiet. The ghosts won't interact with them anymore. Their story is done. But if they do not decide to sacrifice themselves or anybody else inside this area, they will shout and scream, revealing the monster from the muck. And that monster, as we said, is a shambling mount. And this is a terrifying monster for a low party uh, of one to three levels. Uh, this creature has a lot of different resistances, different actions, very strong build to it. And it can kill the party and TPK them relatively easy if they're not an experienced group. So what I would say is if there's an experienced group, give them the chance to try to fight, but don't be afraid to flex the power so they know, oh, maybe it is okay to run away from this creature. Because um, going back in that room, they can run back through the portcullis, they can go through the secret door. The creature is not going to leave this sacrificial area. So if they run right out, that creature can't chase them. So this would be relatively good because if not, the party can die relatively easy. Now this is where it gets crazy, is we're in the final uh, encore, the end of Death Houses. Whether they leave or not, whether they sacrifice or not, we're going to go with the fact that they did not sacrifice anyone. They are not fighting the Shambling Mount, and they are running. So if they are running, they have two options. They can either, one, go up the way they came all the way back up to the attic of the storage room, or if they found that secret room, they can make their way to the first floor. This is extremely important because once they try to leave, every single door inside Death House is a swinging blade. Every door, every single one. And they have to do a deck save to go through every one. And to make it worse, every single fireplace, there's tons of them, emit this noxious poisonous gas. So they cannot even stay in the rooms long enough to kind of decide their next move. I always add other things as well, such as um, the walls might have hands burst and try to grab and pull them in. Uh, there might be sections where the floor is slippery. The stairs might turn into thick um, kind of ramps where they can fall down and slide. And maybe the railings turn into spikes that can try to stab them and skewer them. These are all ways to make that last encounter, you know, dramatic and, you know, time sensitive because you can't stay because of the gases. You have to go through the blades. You can't sit there and meticulously disarm each one. Uh, things might grab you through the wall. There's tons of things you can do. My favorite thing is once they get to that first floor and they're about to leave, I would like you to add one last thing to kind of make this a curiosity kill the cat kind of, you know, final decision thing where when they're leaving, they see one room, whether it's the hunter's den, whether it is the dining room or the kitchen, they see bloody footprints going there. Maybe they see a little face pop and hide. It is their decision to leave and they'll be safe or investigate. And if they investigate, I would punish them for that. I would have them go into that room, the door closes, and let's say it is the dining room. Maybe all the silverware goes and tries to skewer them. Or the wolves inside the fire den animate and come alive and attack as these big dire wolves. Or in the kitchen, the oven bursts into flames, igniting the whole room on fire and the gas. These are all great ways to not punish the party, but punish them for their curiosity of going back into a crazy house. Now, if they did survive everything and they made their way out, I would give them a good reward. If it is a one-shot, maybe give them some cool magic item or gold they can use in another campaign. But I always use this for Curse of Strahd, so what I would do is give them a picnic basket full of expensive wine, fruit, maybe some cookies, and then a letter. And the letter will always have a red wax seal from Strahd, and it'll introduce the campaign in a very good way. 
So kind of to summarize what we talked about today, focus on the story, build up these monsters. Don't just be like, here's ghouls, here's ghosts, here's a grick. Like build up what they look like, what they do, etc. Some of the encounters we talked about is the ghost in the sheets, which is in the storage room, uh, the possessions with um, Rose and Thorn, the grick that hides in the wall, and the well snake that gives them lore. These are all great ways to run a fantastic one shot and one of my favorite Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you spending time going over these lore videos, watching us weekly, as well as our session recaps. You can always follow us on YouTube. It helps out a lot at critical underscore failures, or you can follow us on Twitch uh, for our live games, Critical Failures D&D. Uh, we have a busy, busy week ahead of us. We have a session recap coming today. Uh, we have this video that was posted today as well. And then next week, we will be having our typical every single Wednesday Icewind Dale live stream at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time where you can meet the whole crew. Also next week we'll have a critical recap following right after. So if you stick around after our uh, live stream session on Wednesday, we'll be there for another 35 to 40 minutes getting to meet the cast, being more personal, answering questions from the audience as well. Uh, and then following next week we'll also have a character builder how-to for new D&D players, uh, DMs, tips, and tons more videos coming your way. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for looking into Death House. It is a fantastic one-shot module. I appreciate you. And wherever you are in the world, happy New Year's, happy holidays. And thank you so much for watching Critical Failures. Have a good one.